John. Welcome or welcome back to our online community content. If you would, after this episode, go ahead and take a moment and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And you can also visit our website, fccbrazil.org, where you can find all of our podcasts and any other online community content that we post. But most of all, I hope that you find this next presentation inspiring to lead you to a loving father, a caring community, and a life-changing faith. Enjoy. A woman was desperate, and she went into the police station with a friend. And she said, I've lost my husband. He was 6'2", 185 pounds, blue-eyed, beautiful man, athletic build. Can you find him? The police officer said, I know your husband. 5'2", probably 185, probably closer to 200 pounds. Mean-spirited man, rude, and doesn't like your children or you. What's the deal? The woman said, well, I don't want, that's not the one that I want. Who would want that back? She was desperate. Have you ever been desperate? Henry David Thoreau said, The mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. When I was in college, my preaching professor said it like this, all men live lives of quiet desperation. At that point, I was pretty optimistic, or probably more optimistic about life than maybe I am now, but I still am not quite sure that that is always true. But I would agree that that we all have moments of quiet desperation, don't we? Any of us who has failed or flunked, been fired or flattened, can understand a desperate faith. A missionary in the Far East was observing some some people worship an idol of Buddha. And he thought it was very sad. And as they desperately worshipped and they were poor and impoverished and hungry people and they were laying down offerings of food and of whatever they had, to, to desperately call on Buddha to help them. And at the same time, he noticed that there was a construction crew repairing this old idol. And he thought it was fascinating, is here were people that were crying out to a God that was crumbling, and yet they were so desperate. This morning, I want to ask you if you're desperate or deliberate. And if you have your Bibles or a tablet or a phone, go to John chapter 4, verse 46. And we're going to see another sign in our sign series. And again, we want to thank our Facebook Live audience that that they're joining us today. But it's not as good as being here this morning. Amen? But we're going to look at John chapter 4. And the old apostle is writing, probably the last apostle alive, around 85 A.D., and, and he's sharing with his future audience that was going to read his book so that you might believe what he saw. And so this is what he writes in John chapter 4, verse 46. He says, so he came, and he's referring to Jesus, came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine, tremendous miracle, and at Capernaum there was an official who's son was ill. Now, all of us that have had children know that this is the worst thing that could happen to a parent or a grandparent. For them, for that child, the one whom we are crazy in love with, to be sick. And especially at this moment in history where there wasn't a lot of medicine, there wasn't a lot of capability to cure this illness. This this father, who was an important man, probably in Herod's government, all we know is that he was an official, came to Jesus. 
And look at verse 47. It says, when this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and he asked him to come down and kill his son, for he was at the point of death. Can you imagine being that desperate? Wouldn't you do anything in that moment for your child? I know I would. I've seen it over and over again with cancer pa patients and treatments. They will try anything to survive. And I would too. I am not judging them at all. But this official had probably walked or rode 25 miles to get there to Jesus, humbling himself, begging. You see, the desperate faith drives you to Jesus. And, and a lot of times in church, we see desperate faith. People come because they're desperate. And I don't think that's an accident. I think that's been allowed because there has to be something greater. In John chapter 4, verse 48, John writes on, he says, So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Now, he wasn't being incompassionate to this official. He was probably saying this to the crowd. Show us another miracle. Show us another sign. Perhaps I'll believe. And so he was rebuking them in that moment. And the official said to him, notice he says, Sir, come down before my child dies. That is very, very desperate. Is it not? Now, does Jesus say, hey, I, my heart has compassion for you. I will go with you. I will walk those 25 miles. Is that what he says? No. What does he do? He says, Jesus said to him, <coughs> go, your son will live. And the verb here, go, is a command. Jesus didn't say, hey, I'm going to go with you. No, go. And this is interesting. The go is a command. It's an imperative. Take action. This is what you are to do. What else did he do? You see, when Jesus tells you something, do it. Now, we happen to believe in the Holy Spirit, in the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I, I believe that he is just as alive and well in, in the life of a believer as he was in the first century. And when God tells you something in here and it's confirmed in his word, do it. No matter what the cost, no matter what the risk, just do it. Obey. But I want you to notice something else. Jesus didn't go with him. That's what this desperate man asked. Jesus said, go, and he just went. Because there was an underlying thing going on because people didn't think they would be healed if the healer wasn't present in that moment. In the ancient world, miracles and acts of power were linked to the presence of the miracle worker. But here, the healer refused to be present. Now, 80% of the American population, they did this survey in 2012, 80% believe that miracles probably are, they're pretty certain that they occur. But 59% believe it wholeheartedly. And what's interesting that even about 49% of the non-believers that don't even believe in Jesus or, or in God believe in miracles. Isn't that interesting? Look at the latter part of uh, verse 50. It says, the, the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went on his way. He believed. He believed. The official took action. He, he, he went the way Jesus told him. And I'm fascinated by that because he had to humble himself because Jesus wasn't this mega church preacher, this powerful person, but the, the official actually, he obeyed 
he persisted and he received the promise of the miracle. Have you ever been desperate for a miracle? And yet didn't get it answered the way you wanted? Maybe a loved one had passed, something didn't happen, a child suffered. You ever wonder about that? I do. But the man took Jesus at his word. You know, I believe we should do that. To take Jesus at his word. Don't you? Amen? Jesus still speaks today. Take him at his word. You all know this story. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. And then what did the official do? So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. And the father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And what then occurred? And he himself believed in all his household. And this was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. The second sign of the seven signs in the book of John. And he himself believed. What, why was the book of John written? So that you can believe. We will never see Jesus do a miracle, but we we read from someone or, or, or we read a book by someone who saw and believed. Therefore, we can believe. An observation. Sometimes God allows us to experience desperate faith in order to move us toward a deliberate faith. We don't want to stay in that desperation moment. We want to move to a deliberate faith moment. Because we're going to be tested. We're going to be tried. Jesus is clearly portrayed in the gospel as one who seeks to lead persons through the stages of inadequate, inadequate believing, desperation, to satisfactory believing, deliberate faith, even if it means denying the person or request. You see, the official didn't get what he wanted Jesus to go with him. He got what he really wanted was his child to be healed. Oswald Chambers writes this. He wrote the book, My Utmost for, My Utmost for His Highest. He writes this. Faith is the deliberate confidence in the character of God whose ways you may not understand at the time. Faith is the deliberate confidence in the character of God whose ways you may not understand at the time. Has God ever moved you in a situation or placed you in a situation where you didn't know what to do and you were desperate? Why? And the question that this all begs is simply this. How can I have a deliberate faith? How can I have a deliberate faith? And I, and I believe this is really, really important because we're going to be placed in those moments. We are going to have those moments in our lives. And I want to look at five ways. Number one, God is calling you to deliberately yield yourself to build up your most holy faith. We have to yield ourselves to God, to put our faith and our trust in Him no matter what, to deliberately yield ourselves. That's hard to do, because what do, we, what do we typically do? We fear, we are anxious, we, we, we act out in frustration, and that is the moment when we need deliberate faith. God is calling you deliberately to yield yourself. Number two, plan to connect with God daily. A General Kraslock, and I don't know if I'm saying his name correctly, 1991 Desert Storm under General Schwarzkopf. Now, in the Middle East, we might think 
that oil and gas are what they fight over. Not so. What do you think the other, other natural, what do I say, resource they fight over? It's, anybody? Water. Absolutely water. And they were 14 days from stepping, stepping off in, into Desert Storm in 1991. Do you remember that? And, and all of our accumulated military force was behind the Kuwaiti lines. And the problem was they needed 100,000 gallons of water a day to resource our troops as they would invade Iraq. But, but they didn't have it. And, and Schwarzkopf wanted to go, well, he didn't want to go right up head-to-head -head against the Iraqi army, but instead he wanted to flank them to go around to the left and, and go around them, but that would take him into this place they called the Gravel Desert. And throughout the ages, there's always been a problem in that Gravel Desert, and, and the problem was this. There was no water. The other part of this story was that Kraslock, General Kraslock, was converted, converted or, or came to, to the Lord in 1976. So he'd been walking with God for 15 years, and it was his habit every morning to get up at 7.15 a.m. and study his Bible and pray. And so he gathered all of his subordinate officers, and they were having a prayer meeting during those 14 days. And a day before they stepped off, somebody who had been driving the 60-mile road into Kuwait, over within about a mile of the border, over on the left side, about 20 yards off the road, there was this Derek-like thing, a white thing with a white cross on top of it. It had some hoses going out. And it looked like that there had might have been an old railroad station there that had been abandoned years and years ago. There was a generator there with 500 gallons of diesel fuel. You know anything about our American military? There was no diesel fuel there. And so the general, they drove the general out there to check this out, and, 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 and he said, you know, do you got a key to the generator? Sir, we have no key. And so he pressed the on button, and, and the batteries around this generator were uh, in plastic, and the generator started, and guess what? It started pumping water. Now he had his engineers come and, and, and find out how much water it would pump, and guess how much water it pumped? 100,000 gallons a day. 100,000 gallons a day. In the London Times, it was called the Miracle Well that year. Folks, I don't know if you believe in miracles or not, but God is still in the business of doing miracles, and we have to develop that deliberate faith. Plan to connect with God daily. Number three, establish a method for this daily deliberate practice of your faith. I know how mine works. Get that cup of coffee. I sit down in my lazy boy. I get out my tablet get on you version, I read the word, I spend some time in prayer, and then I journal. That's what I do. Whatever you do that works for you, whatever time, you need to establish a method and purpose to do that daily, to walk with God daily. Number four, make an appointment with God. Make an appointment with God. And I just told you that. For, for the general, it was 7.15 a.m. For me, it's probably around 6.30, 6.15. But that's when I do that. For you, it might be when you go to bed. It might be at lunchtime. Whenever you have the time, it might be when you're feeding your child or giving the child a bottle. I don't know when, when it will be for you. But that time with God is super, super important. That's what's caused me to survive. I've got a mom that prays for me. We've got a prayer team that prays for me every week. And that time with God. Because only 5% of ministers finish the race. They fight the fight. Keep the faith. The attrition rate is high. Number five and last. Determine to follow Jesus no matter what. Determine 
no matter what occurs, no matter how bad it gets, determined to stay on the line and trust God and walk with Him. Amen? Would you please stand as I pray? Eternal God and Father, we are so grateful that we have the opportunity to...